Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. Our focus today is on cancer and your health. In partnership with the UVM Cancer Center, Across the Fence is able to call on some of the top cancer experts in the country. This afternoon we'll discuss oral, head and neck cancers, which affect an estimated 65,000 Americans every year. If you or someone you know has a sore throat that doesn't go away or has difficulty swallowing, these may be symptoms of cancer. To learn more, I'm joined by two UVM Cancer Center members. Dr. Molly Berry is a hematology and oncology specialist, and Dr. Carl Nelson is a radiation oncology specialist. Thank you both for coming in. Now, this is a, a cancer that we really don't hear a whole lot about, in part because oral head and neck are less common than other cancers. Could you start off by sort of giving us an overview of this category? Sure. So, head and neck cancers uh, can develop in different areas um, that span as high up. Uh, to behind the nose called the nasopharynx, mm -hmm. um, the nasal cavity. Then going farther down the oropharynx includes the tonsils, the base of tongue, your oral cavity, which is your tongue, your lips, um, the bottom of your mouth, and then down to your vocal cords, the area called the larynx and the hypopharynx right behind it. Mm -hmm. And so how common are these types of cancers? So uh, nationally, head and neck cancers are about four to five percent of um, the cancers that are diagnosed each year. Um, there are certain types that um, seem to be coming more prevalent, but in general, it's, it's about four to five percent overall. And how about, does it affect the same amount of men and women? So typically, um, men are affected twice as often as women. Um, there are different reasons for this. Um, past behavioral uh, reasons include smoking and drinking more prevalent um, in these populations, but then with the uh, increase in HPV or human uh, papillomavirus related cancers seems uh, to have more of an effect on men than women. Mm. Molly, do we know the causes of these cancers? Um, as with many cancers, the modifiable risk factors that we often see in head and neck cancers are alcohol and tobacco use. Um, and this leads into some of our our belief to go with encouraging people to change their modifiable behaviors, but um, our Department of Health is offering the 3450 campaign um, with tobacco use being one of those behaviors. Yeah, let's um, talk about the 3450 sure. campaign. Three, we see on the screen the behaviors. So there's three behaviors um, a lack of physical activity, poor diet, and tobacco use leading to four diseases. Um, cancer being one of those four, along with heart disease and stroke, type 2 diabetes, and lung disease, which, report, uh, which result in over 50% of the deaths in Vermont. And so um, modifying some behaviors can reduce the risk? So for head and neck cancer, uh, modifying your behavior in terms of stopping tobacco use, and that includes both uh, cigarettes as well as oral forms of tobacco, um, will decrease your risk for developing head and neck cancer in some cases, along with uh, modifying and decreasing alcohol use. Um, along with that, the other risk factor for head and neck cancer is the human papillomavirus, which Carl had mentioned, um, that this is a virus that is relatively common in the population and is, a, is a risk factor and an increasing risk factor for head and neck cancers. I think, as, as the notes say, for especially in younger people under 50? Yes, yeah, so we're starting to see more and more people develop head and neck cancer younger uh, because of the HPV infection. And this um, is now becoming an increasing number in our population of head and neck cancers, up to potentially up to 70% of the cases are now being seen with HPV positivity. Really? And specifically, it's interesting because we talked about the risk factors. There are some of these people who have never smoked very light. Um, alcohol use and yet they show up with this head and neck cancer and um, almost invariably it's related to the HPV um, uh, and these these people are typically they're they're younger than what we've seen before they're healthier and a lot of them um, are 
trying to work or, or live, live their lives and, and getting this diagnosis and getting the treatment is, is a big burden and a big impact for people who have tried to lead, lead very healthy lives. Mm -hmm. And we talk about the 70%, um, as many as 70% of the head and neck cancers diagnosed today are associated with HPV, which I want to talk a little bit more about. But they're also, what about the other 30%? Um, the other 30% are related often to tobacco and alcohol use, uh, along with, you know, potentially other, some other chemical exposures mm -hmm. that are, you know, can be less accounted for in terms of environmental or occupational exposures. Um, but the other thing to re remember is that up to 70% are associated with HPV, but that doesn't mean that alcohol and tobacco didn't play a role in those as well. Um, so the, the tobacco and alcohol use are still a significant an important factor, especially because of the fact that we can change them, uh, change those behaviors and in, in, in modify the amount of, of those exposures that we have. Mm -hmm. Does the HPV vaccine protect against cancers of the head and the neck? So we are, believe, uh, we are in <laughs> the, we are believing that they are probably going to be Showing us in the decades to come that these cancer, that these vaccines are going to help prevent cancers of um, of the head and neck. Though the research will take decades to to prove. Um, what we can say now is that it does seem to be decreasing the amount of chronic infections that we're seeing. Yeah. And specifically, the the HPV vaccine was initially introduced to um, help prevent cervical cancer, and almost 100% of cervical cancers are caused by the HPV virus. Um, there are other cancers that are caused by the HPV virus, um, both in men and women. Um, so it, even though the original intent of this um, vaccine was to, to help prevent cervical cancers, there's no reason to believe that the similar strains of viruses that cause oral, uh, oropharynx cancers uh, wouldn't be effective and reduced by, um, by the vaccine. Let's talk about the vaccine. Who should get it and when should they get it? So the current recommendations, which is supported by the um, Centers for Disease Control and multiple um, oncology or cancer organizations, um, recommend both boys and girls being um, vaccinated. And it appears that vaccination at a younger age, um, specifically around the, up to ages 11 and 12, appear to be more effective. And if they're vaccinated at that age, they only need two in, uh, vaccinations um, six months apart. They um, also recommend that you can get vaccinated up to the age of 26 for men and women. Um, but if you do get vaccinations at that older, um, older age than as children, um, they are recommending three vaccinations. But it still can be effective even if you're older than 11 or 12. Mm -hmm. And parents who might have questions about the vaccine and wonder whether or not it's something that they should have their child exposed to, you would recommend that there's I think we a would. good thing. Both, especially given our experience treating head and neck cancers, we would say unequivocally, yes, we would recommend it um, both to our patients' children, to any children, to our children. Um, uh, part of the reason to, to do it as early, and I know that a lot of parents say, well, maybe we should wait and consider doing it later. And as Carl had mentioned, you know, it will require potentially three vaccines, three injections later as opposed to two when they're younger, um, in part is because our immune system is better at developing antibodies as we're younger, um, but also because it's important. What they've found is that there is a better response to it if it's given before the exposure to HPV occurs. Mm -hmm. And so we talked about other preventative measures as well, um, and alcohol and tobacco use. Mm -hmm. And so uh, are there differences in head and neck cancers caused by HPV as compared to those caused by tobacco and alcohol use? We have found that there are differences in the HPV-related cancers as opposed to the non-HPV-related cancers. And part of that is the way that the cancer develops and the way that the, um, the cancer is driven in the cells. Mm -hmm. And the HPV-related cancers are actually a different um, they have a different biology, and so the mutation that occurs is in a protein that then drives the cancer as opposed to it being part of another gene. And so while the specifics aren't necessary for, for someone to necessarily understand what it 
comes down to is that there tends to be a better prognosis for the HPV positive cancers than those that are um, related to other, other mm -hmm. causes, including tobacco and alcohol. So how are these cancers diagnosed? So uh, it, it kind of relates to how, the, um, how they come about. So um, specifically for cancers related to alcohol and tobacco, um, for people who um, chew tobacco or from some parts of the world they chew betel nut, um, for chewing tobacco, the, the cancers um, often show up in the lips, in the gums, in the tongue. Mm -hmm. um, so if uh, people notice that, or sometimes the dentist, um, when they're doing some work, will notice something in that part of the mouth. Um, that's how that uh, often comes about. For HPV-related and, and some of the smoking-related um, cancers, it most uh, commonly forms in the back of the tongue or the tonsils. And a lot of people actually notice a swelling in the lymph nodes in their neck. Sometimes for men, they notice it shaving. They notice a lump, and it doesn't seem to go away. Or they go to their doctor, and they say, I have a sore throat and a lump in my neck. And they give them some antibiotics, typically. And it may get better for a week or two, but then it comes back, and it persists. Um, those are the most common ways that we see people. For people with cancers of the larynx or the vocal cords, they often present with hoarseness or um, pain when speaking, but most often it's hoarseness or the friends around them will notice that their voice is changing. These are all signs if they persist that you really, um, that we recommend that people get attention as soon as they can. Well, that's kind of scary because it's kind of a common, <laughs> yes. common presentations, really. It's not uncommon for people to go through one or two courses of antibiotics for a sore throat before they end up being referred. And the first place that they're often referred by their primary care doctors is to our colleagues in the ear, nose, and throat, uh, the ENT docs, the surgeons. Mm -hmm. um, and they will often do the first uh, workup, and that may include a biopsy um, with a small needle in the office to get cells, or sometimes it requires going for a, a surgery to take out a node or to biopsy a, a tonsil or the base of the tongue. Mm -hmm. And so following a diagnosis, what is the treatment and what's the prognosis? So it really depends on where in the head and neck the cancer rises and the stage of it. So for some cancers, um, specifically in the the, what we call the oral cavity, so the tongue, the lips, mm -hmm. um, the front of the mouth, um, or even the larynx, surgery is often the first treatment for it. Sometimes it, it can be the only treatment for it. However, the, if it's spread to the lymph nodes or if it's a larger tumor, um, often it can either be a surgery followed by radiation and chemotherapy or a combination of radiation and chemotherapy together. And so what does that look like for the patient? So. It's a, very, it's a very arduous and, and difficult process for the patient. And I tell people this very early on. This is a very difficult treatment. Um, you're going to spend a lot of time with us. The radiation treatments are typically are about seven weeks, um, five days a week, Monday through Friday. Really? Each, yes. Each treatment takes about 15 to 20 minutes a day. Um, the radiation treatments are x-rays that we aim at the tumor. So they don't feel the radiation, but as the weeks go on throughout the treatment, people develop side effects, and the side effects can be quite painful. Um, and we have to work very closely to, to make sure that they're able to get through them because we have very, very high cure rates with this. Um, and despite all of the difficulty getting through the treatment, the alternative for the cancer to grow and spread is a much worse outcome than the side effects that the treatment gives. So. What else do you want people to know about oral head and neck cancers? I think the most important things to remember are that in part there are a lot of modifiable risk factors for this disease. That alcohol use and tobacco use are risk factors particularly together and that cutting down particularly on tobacco use is a major way to decrease your risk for developing this cancer. Um, for adults, uh, HPV exposure has probably already happened, so that's not necessarily a modifiable risk factor for, um, for those of us that are not children anymore, but for our children um, that considering getting the HPV vaccine could reduce their risk for um, not only cervical cancer in our, in our daughters, but in our sons, potentially um, oral at the head and neck cancers. What resources do you recommend for folks? Um, we would recommend 
the cancer.gov website mm -hmm. um, where there is information about cancers of the head and neck as well as any other type of cancers. Um, and the tobacco cessation resources in Vermont which provide free um, resources to our, to our community, um, 802quits.org as well as um, on the UVM webs, uh, uvm.edu tobacco free. Well, I want to thank you for joining me today. It's, um, you know, obviously very important information. And if people have questions and think that maybe they're having some of these symptoms, they should definitely see their doctor and get that checked out. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks thank for you. joining us. That's our program for today. I'm Judy Simpson. I'll see you again next time on Across the Fence.